Well, hello, everybody, and happy Monday. Welcome to Act 3. We are so glad that you joined us today. In the Zoom booth recording today, we have Krista Whitaker with her brand new company called Wildwood Kinesiology. I'm not going to say it right. Kinesiology. She's a kinesiologist. I hope I said that right. Krista, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's always great to have you, sweetie. Listen, I don't really know what a kinesiologist is. So why don't we start there and then like kind of break this open for people like me who are not really clear on what kinesiologists do. That's right. Um, yeah, so a kinesiologist um, is an individual who has received a four-year undergrad degree from certain universities. Um, they have to be accredited. They have to, you know, certain courses and stuff you have to take. Um, from after that four years, you can then apply to different for your province. So each province has different regulatory bodies, and then you can become a kinesiologist. So I have my kinesiology degree and then I applied, I fit the bill. I can then become a kinesiologist. Um, so it's someone who's a human movement specialist is what I always say. Um, you know, they have education in anatomy, um, biomechanics, motor control. So anything about the body, how the mind connects with the body, um, everything under that umbrella. So it's different than a, a, a physiotherapist. It's That's different right. than a chiropractor, Whoa. yet it's still that body motion kind of stuff, right? So what, what, what a, I, I, I think I have an idea, but can you break it down a bit more? Is it when you say exercises, what do you mean by that? Like, is it stuff with balls and like those big uh, giant balls that are on the floor that people use or like, tell me, tell us more. Yeah, of course. Um, and it's a common question. Most people ask, okay, what's a kinesiologist compared to a physiotherapist and things like that. So um, a physiotherapist would have to go on and um, receive their master's. And then again, it's the same kind of accreditation process. You have to apply to the, their board and different things. Um, a kinesiologist, I always compare is, um, active rehab. So we do that portion where, you know, you're starting to engage the muscles, you're strengthening the muscles. Um, physios also prescribe exercise, but I find it's not as detailed. So that's my whole background and understanding. And so I have more knowledge in that. Um, and then a physio would also diagnose. So they would do lots of tests on your shoulder and they would determine, oh, you might have a torn ligament. That's not what I would do. I would say, Hey, they would tell me maybe you, the client has a torn ligament. I would be like, okay, let's strengthen certain areas of the body and put them through different motor control activities so that we can get functional rehab back. How long does it take to get functional rehab back? Is it, you know, is it prescribable or is it something? And, you know, I'm just thinking about a person who may have gone through a car accident or may have gone through some kind of a really solid physical uh, abnormality and how long, you know, and, and what kind of procedure would somebody do if they've, if they're coming to you for support? Mm -hmm. Common question for sure. And unfortunately, it's very complex to answer. Um, Every body is super different. And so um, you have to factor in age and just the um, commitment to the program and various things, right? Nutrition and sleep, that's how our body all recovers. Um, most of the time, if I'm seeing an individual who has been through a car accident and has injuries, I see them twice a week for 45 minutes. Um, we do exercises together as well as they have an at-home program. So they would see me twice. They would also have an at-home program. They would do two, three, four times a week. Um, and then again, it's anywhere from, I've seen a client from four months to, you know, two, three years. Right. And it just sometimes takes that long for the body to recover. And, um, our body's not supposed to go through trauma in terms of car accidents. So it does take a little while. Yeah. Yeah, the body kind of remembers that trauma for years to come. So I would imagine that even though you're trying to solve the immediate problem, it's a process, I think, sometimes for, you know, if that if your body is re-traumatized, does the muscle remember to come back to kinesiology? Did I say it right that time? Kinesiology? Oh. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Um, yeah, the muscle, definitely muscle memory. Uh, we always call it, especially when I speak with athletes, right. When you're really fit and you're an athlete and you're kind of in your prime and then you kind of get a little less fit, but your body remembers. So it's quicker to come back to that same state. Um, so I would say again, with the body, um, it can remember it's again, complex because often if you're in a lot of pain, you start to compensate and move differently. 
And those movements aren't the efficient movements for our body. So then you have to retrain movements and re-strengthen through the proper um, movement pattern. So it does take a little bit longer if someone's a little bit more under chronic pain or something like that. Chronic pain is something that so many of our listeners experience. And, you know, I wonder, is there, um, I think a common issue is spinal right, where people have bad posture, they sit incorrectly, they stand incorrectly. Um, as a kinesiologist, can you help to refigure those abnormalities in the way that people are structured? Yeah, for sure. Um, sitting, sitting posture is something I talk about often with my clients, because it's not just for ones who have experienced an injury or a car accident or thing like that. We're often on our computers and we're in front of TVs. And so we sit a lot more. So um, we often have something called almost like an upper cross syndrome, which is like kind of rounded shoulders, your neck, your chin's kind of poked out, um, things like that. And so there's many exercises, stretching, um, strengthening that um, the everyday person can do to kind of alleviate that and get our spine in a nice um, position so we don't have chronic pain. Um, I would also say core strength as well, just being able to sit with a neutral pelvis um, in your chair is something that's important. And um, kids also have backgrounds in ergonomics. So if you are finding that your job requires you to sit um, for long periods of time, you know, there's little things we can take to make um, to advise on to make sure that you're sitting in the proper position. So because we're on the radio, people can't actually see what that position might look like. But I can tell you for certain that if you're watching by YouTube, then you'll note that I was kind of rolling my eyes a little bit and I was sort of shifting a little bit. And the reason is, is because quite frankly, I know that, that one of the issues that I have had, and I think a lot of people that I know have had, is that we sit, like you said, in front of the computer for many hours a day and the body starts to drop and it starts to shift. And I don't know about, you know, how to fix this. Maybe you can help walk through it, but the stiffness in the neck, in the shoulders, in the hip joints, you know, and I'm not the lightest woman on the planet. I used to be much more, much less verbose than I am now, right? Let's put it that way. Um, and so I find that the, with even with the weight, sleeping becomes more challenging, especially if I've been sitting in a chair all day. Do you have any recommendations for ways for people to, if not visually through our YouTube station uh, in listening to the program here on Chile, how can we sit better or how, what, what, what would you recommend we do to sort of alleviate some of that stiffness that comes with being in the same spot for a long period of time. Definitely. Um, and it's, it's hard to explain. I mean, there's many exercises that um, we could do together and I'm very, um, or I, I don't know the right word, but I want to definitely see you and um, coach you through those exercises so they're done properly. Um, but if kind of advice right here, I would say definitely try and get up and move every so often. So don't sit for two, three hours, try and only sit for, you know, 30 minutes, get up and move. Um, any sort of basic stretching to do in between. That's also good for our brain health, right? Too. Like that's going to um, engage the brain as better as well to get more work and stuff. Um, I would also say like, kind of my thing is we're sitting up tall, shoulders are back, um, core is still engaged though. So don't, we just want to stick our chest out. Um, and then we also want our feet to be sitting on something. If our knees, our hips can't be at 90 degrees. So we want kind of a 90 degree angle along there too. And then our feet may be sitting on something if we can't, and then arms are just below chest level. So that's kind of our ideal situation. And then computer at, um, eye height, right? We don't want to be chin tucked or poked out or anything like that. And that's going to give us kind of the, the best positioning for sitting. For that very reason, I went out and I bought a new chair because the chair that I was sitting on was really difficult. I felt myself really hovering over and slouching. The lower part of my back was really bent over and very, very uncomfortable because, you know, at the best, you know, Monday through Friday and probably a good part of the weekend as well, I'm sitting in front of this computer doing something, right? Whether it's the radio show, whether it's, you know, stuff for the television program, whatever it is uh, in my everyday business of living, there's a lot of time sitting on my babushka, which can be really hard. Um, you know, a lot of people have found the Fitbits and these exercise uh, models on, that they wear on their wrist to be helpful. What's your take on that kind of stuff? Is it, do you, do you find it to be uh, beneficial in any way or does it have a, its own set of problems? 
Yeah, I mean, I think they're a great guide um, to kind of say, you know, how much we should be moving. Like the average is kind of the 10,000 steps, right? Adults should try and get that many. Um, I wouldn't say you have to rely on it though. Like physical activity or movement can be, you know, just gardening outside can be, um, you know, cleaning up a little bit in the house, right? As long as we're just moving and using our bodies. Um, and so I find people get a little stuck on the 10,000 steps and thinking, oh, I have to go for a walk or I have to get that many. Um, and it's not necessarily true. It's great to have that as a, as a marker, but um, just moving our bodies and being active is important as well. So this has become a real passion for you. Of course, you studied for it in university. You've also worked in our community for quite some time. You know, what prompted you to decide to go the extra mile and bring this to fruition as a business? Definitely. Um, I would say that it's kind of always been my goal to have kind of my own thing. Um, and can kind of took off for me. I was really lucky um, to get into a few different um, populate to working with a few different populations that I was able to work on my own full time. And often kids can't usually do that. You have to work in a clinic set setting and then build up. And then often you're still kind of part time. And so you have another part time job and it's it's not great. Right. So um, I branched out. I did lots of volunteer work and branched out into the community and got to work with many different populations. Um, and I think it just kind of snowballed from there. I realized that I'm passionate about the business side, but I'm also passionate about the kin side and I want to bridge that together. Um, and I would also say to kind of advocate for the kin world. They're not that well known. Um, and I think they're a really important part of, you know, rehabilitation and the whole healthcare system, especially since, you know, physios and, and other professionals are becoming so busy. They don't have time to do the exercise. And how I always word it too is our life is active. So we should be doing active rehab for the last little bit instead of passive rehab. Many people want to go kind of sit and get needles or soft tissue release at physio, but that's not how our life moves like that, right? So active rehab is a natural step. Um, so yeah, I would say just bringing business and kin together and advocating for kins too is kind of my passion right now. I love how you call it kin. Kin is an old word that is family. It means family. And so I guess, you know, you're creating a family within the body system in this particular work, right? It, and I, I can sort of visualize it as being that safety zone where once that muscle is built and once you become habitual in the exercises, they can really serve you for a long time. How much of it do you find to be effective on a daily basis? Is it something that people have to commit to at 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes, an hour, three days, three hours a day? Like, what does it look like to get the most optimum benefit mm -hmm. from an injury in the way of healing? Because I'm also to the understanding that if you work that injury too hard, you could put yourself back in injury, right? So mm -hmm. definitely. And, um, it kind of depends. Like I said, I do work with a few different populations. So, you know, for the pediatric population where I do a lot of fine and gross motor skills, um, when you're building strength, you know, we have to include the parents too, because one session a week or two sessions a week for 15, 20 minutes isn't enough. And so, you know, if you're trying to improve, you know, let's say upper body strength or postural control, control the kids need to be doing probably three hours in total a week. Um, so that's a big, um, increase from what I can just do with them. You know, if we're talking about ICBC clients or orthopedic clients, um, I would say it's a little bit of give and take, right? We, um, you know, prescribe something, you know, two, three times a week. Um, and then when they come back to see us, we chat about it and see, okay, did that cause pain? How was that for you? You know, I always say, we also don't want to be sore past 24 to 48 hours, so if someone's, you know, really sore three days later, that's too much for the body. And that's an indicator that we need to let off a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's really just kind of a give and take. We figure it out as we go um, kind of process. I'm really glad that you said that because some people in my generation have the no pain, no gain philosophy, right? And that's really can be very destructive, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It definitely can. It definitely can. And I always think if, a client has experienced pain, we're not doing the movement correctly, or I need to come up with a better exercise where we can gain strength and motor control and functional ability without pain. Um, we often, 
our human body is kind of a pattern, right? So if we're just reinforcing the pain, that's what we're going to keep feeling. Um, that being said, sometimes there's a little bit of discomfort and that's okay, but it's not extreme pain, you know, 10 out of 10 scale sort of thing. Yeah. I think that, that there's something to be said for that pain, just if, if nothing more than just that range of motion of knowing how far that limit can go, because really at the end, if you've got that limit, then you get to push it a little bit further to, to really stretch it. And I suspect that from particularly for muscles, they need that kind of gentle push, right? That's right. Yeah. It's just gentle. And we're trying to increase, um, you know, the, whatever goal we're going over, increase it over time. It's not going to happen in one session. It's not going to happen in two. Um, and so we're just constantly connecting me, uh, you know, mind body control and things like that. And, and it's slow and, it, and it's a process for sure. How much does circulation have to do with the pain factor that people have? Um, it definitely, um, it definitely comes into, into play. Um, I don't know tons about exact circulation and blood supply and things like that. Of course, the better blood supply we have, the more we're going to recover and things like that. Um, I would say chronic pain and pain is more to our kind of nervous system or things like that. And, and chronic pain is really related to how the brain's interpreted, interpreting things, things like that. So, mm -hmm. So in your own experience, have you ever been in an experience yourself where you've had to go through some significant physical pain and that kind of helped you understand what it was you were doing from a study module? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, I have two situations. Uh, when I was a younger athlete, I tore my ACL and MCL. So I had to get surgery and things like that. And so that's actually what... Um, why I jumped into like a kin world or a kin degree essentially was that accident or injury. And then, um, the physio and working together, I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I'm actually, I experienced a car accident three years ago, three or four years ago now. Um, and I really, I hurt my clavicle and ligaments around it. And, um, yeah, I had to rehab and, you know, having my background and still having to rehab and rehab and put in the effort. And I know my body well, um, definitely appreciation for clients who, you know, don't have the understanding or the background and they're trying to get back to, you know, a pain-free state. It, it takes a while and it takes a lot of patience for sure. No doubt. How long did it take you to actually come through those? Or do you still at times experience pain? Yeah, unfortunately, I still experience some pain and discomfort. Um, and it's just knowing my body and, um, you know, going back and continuing with some exercises if I need to. And um, even when I'm at the gym, you know, I'm still not back at the weight I was, but making sure that the mechanics are correct so that I'm not stressing um, certain areas too much. Um, yeah, it takes a while and I'm definitely still recovering a bit. One of the things I've always valued about you is your athletic background and the things that you did in your life prior to coming to community in the way that you have over the last few years. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your experience as an athlete? Yeah, for sure. Um, it definitely plays into why I'm in this line of work too. Um, I was fortunate when I was younger, I was picked for the provincial soccer team. Um, and so played that all summer. We went to Germany, which was a really neat experience. Um, and then the next year, actually, I loved volleyball. Uh, so I kind of changed directions and I played provincial volleyball, which was also a really cool experience. Went to Alberta and played different provinces. Um, realized soccer was the main sport for me. Um, and so I received a scholarship to attend UBC, uh, played for the five years there and, uh, Actually, in my final year, I was a co-captain. There was me and two other girls. We were co-captains and we won nationals. So um, on home turf. So, you know, we had big audience and, and we won. And, um, you know, you always remember those vivid uh, memories. Oh, yeah. And I don't have a very good memory. So, and I remember kind of the exact game and a lot of the points from it. And um, yeah, my athletic career was a really neat um, experience because not many can actually say those things either. A lot of times you go to university and you have five long years and, you know, you don't get that peak ending. Yeah. And um, yeah. I definitely received that peak ending. Wow. I think it's incredible that you were able to, to be part of two provincial athletic teams. And certainly soccer is, 
one of the most loved sports in our country. I mean, everybody likes soccer, right? And especially in Vancouver, right? Not even near UBC, but in downtown off Commercial Street in Vancouver, you know, people line up in the uh, in the coffee district on Commercial Avenue and they just watch soccer like it's going out of style. And I know it's not the same, but it is the same because that's the, it, it's, it's the premise that leads you there. If you have just tuned in, you have tuned into Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 7 FM in beautiful downtown Nanaimo. We're really, really thrilled that you joined us today. As you know, we are recording via Zoom. So if there are some background noises, chimes a chime and dogs a bark and rings a ringing and bells are going off, don't even think about it. It's part of the fabulous experience of being part of the Zoom experience. So thank you again for joining us. In the Zoom booth, I have Krista Whitaker. Her brand new company is called Wildwood kinesiology is that how, how you call what do you call your company what's the name of it darling wildwood health there you go wildwood health there you go um and so she has been talking to us today about the importance of taking care of our bodies and doing it through kin so um i'm curious now i mean COVID 19 has really hit people hard um a couple of, i've got a couple of things that are related to COVID. let's start with the first for those athletes, those exercise people that love going to the gym and are unable to, uh, or if they've been going at very limited openings and openings and closings, of course, throughout the province are changing all the time. Um, can you give people, you know, an indication on how to deal with that frustration of not being able to work out in the way that they used to? Definitely. Um, common question too among me and my friends as well. I mean, knowing my athletic background, we're all very active people. Um, I would say, you know, be patient and compassionate with yourself as well. Um, we're all dealing with a pandemic, but um, I would also say, you know, maybe change it up a little bit. Um, I used to be very regimented. I was going to the gym and that was, is what it is. But now, you know, I go for a walk instead, or, um, you know, I walk up the hills a few times or go for runs and we're fortunate that weather's changing right now too. So you can get outside a lot more and you can maybe experience a new activity you didn't think you were going to do before. My partner and I, we bought mountain bikes. Um, about four months ago. And so we started mountain biking and different things that I probably wouldn't have tried because I would have been stuck in my gym routine. So appreciating that there's some difference right now. And like I said, being compassionate and accepting and things like that. Yeah, I love the idea of trying new things. Mountain biking has never been one of the ones that I want to do. I don't know. And, and biking as a whole, don't get me wrong. I used to live in Vancouver. So I used to go to Stanley Park and bike around Stanley Park all the time. But, you know, as I've gotten older, bicycling is not it. However, what I love about mountain biking is the tires are so wide. So you must have just such a rush going through the, do you go through the woods when you do it? Or do you just, are you street or what do you do? Yeah, no, I definitely trails um, up through Westwood or Dumont, things like that. Um, I haven't got into road biking yet. Actually, they're completely different bikes. Um, uh, like road bikes are like little thin wheels and you can kind of go really fast where, yeah, mountain bikes are kind of thicker tread and you can climb up um, steeper terrain and things like that. Yeah, but it's a really good idea. Like you said, the weather is getting better, uh, especially as we move into spring, the cherry blossoms are out, you know, the daffodils are coming up. Um, but overall, there's a different freshness in the air, which brings me to the next question when it comes to COVID-19 and our bodies breaking down, have you experienced clients that have gone through some form of depression in their body, in, not only in their physiological self, but in their physical self and what, what can, can do to help alleviate some of those pressures? Yeah, I would definitely say that, um, you know, people's mental health is definitely changing a little bit. And of course, that affects our commitment to exercise programs, affects, you know, the mind body connection and how our body's reacting to it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say King can help just keep you accountable. It's always easier when you have, you know, a coach or a buddy um, joining you in the exercise. Um, a Kin's going to be able to kind of streamline activities. So if you are feeling a little more under the weather, we can say, hey, you know, don't do all 10 exercises. Let's just do three today. And that's perfect. Right. Um, and yeah, just keeping the body moving. That's definitely what a kin could do. When we talk about keeping the body moving, how much, uh, oxygen ha is really uh, a part of it? Is it better moving inside or moving outside? Like, is, does there, does it matter to the body how we take the oxygen in? Does that make sense? I know yeah, it's a hard yeah, question, but 
Yeah. yeah, I would say, um, I would say it probably doesn't matter. I would always advise outside over inside or, you know, bigger spacious areas. If you are inside, um, okay. of course, inside right now has masks, right? If you're in a gym setting, um, and you're, you have to be far, far apart, you have to wear your mask. And so you're just not getting the same amount of oxygen and breathing capacity, um, and lung volume and things like that when you're running on a treadmill inside. So for sure right now, I advise being outside as much as possible. And it's a safer method for exercise right now too. So yeah, it really is. And there's a lot of places that you can go right now to be able to get that exercise, even if you're not able to take classes. So if I was to call your uh, Wildwood Health, what would I, what could I expect when I called you? What, what would be basically, how would we do this? Like, what does that look like for the average person to call? Definitely. Um, and it depends on the service you need. I would say that's kind of the first step. Um, like I said, I work with many populations, so you could be a parent calling me um, for pediatric service, and that could be working on finding gross motor programs. Um, I also phrase myself kind of as a special education PE teacher. So, you know, going through some distant learning schools, I'm covering the physical health guidelines um, with that as well. Um, so again, we would just chat about your kid, figure out um, the program, how I can help, things like that. Um, I also receive a lot of calls for ICBC, um, motor vehicle accidents, things like that. And so it would just be setting up an initial appointment to do the initial assessment. Um, and then I would probably see you based off the assessment once or twice a week. Um, I always advise twice a week, just at the beginning so that we're getting the program down. And then, you know, after four weeks to eight weeks, then you're off, you're able to do your own little program at home. And then maybe only once a week to see me following that. Um, but yeah, we would just chat and figure out a time to come on into my schedule and my little space and do an initial assessment. So you're, I, I, this is actually a perfect segue for, for me to tell our listeners on act three, hey, you guys, this is the time of the program when you're supposed to go grab a piece of paper and a pen, right? Usually around this time, we tell people so that they can reach out to you. If you have just tuned in, you are listening to CHLY 101.7 FM. I am Kathy Holmes. I am your host for Act 3. Really, really glad that you joined us. Krista Whitaker is in the booth and she is sharing with her her insights regarding kinesiology. Did I say it right that time? I think that might have been right. And your yes. fourth time is the lucky one. Some of these ologists are more difficult to pronounce than others. So, you know, when people come, like, hopefully they're going to get, grab their pen and paper and shortly we're going to give out your information. So you said you have a little space. Are you, yes. uh, whereabouts in uh, the city are you located? Yeah, so right now I'm just in a local gym. Um, so with COVID, you're allowed inside exercise for adults as long as they're not classes or group things. Um, so I'm in a gym space, but I'm actually converting to um, my own space in the coming months, which is really exciting. So again, has a little gym area, has a few clinics or has a few treatment um, spaces. Um, and that's going to be kind of central Nanaimo. So that's great. And so with your program, are you funded by ICBC? Are you like, how is, how do people, is it part of medical care? Uh, do you, are you covered by insurance? Any of those kinds of things that could be helpful for people if they want to get your services? Yeah, definitely. Um, so with ICBC, I direct bill, which makes it really easy for um, individuals. I don't charge any more than the ICBC rate either. So people don't have to pay any more out of pocket. Um, so that they would come to me, I would submit um, initial assessment to ICBC, get approval for a certain number of sessions. And then based off the improvement over that many weeks, I might submit again and keep submitting until the client is pain free, essentially. Um, so that's nice and easy for um, people because they don't pay out of pocket and they also don't have to bill or anything. Yeah, it's great to have it so that it's simplified, right? People get a little bit freaked out about mm -hmm. the other side. So people who have just tuned in, you're ready to give your information to, I'm assuming. What? How do people reach you, Krista? That's right. Yeah. So you can reach me um, on email, which would be Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A, um, at wildwoodhealth.com. Um, wild is with an E. So that sometimes gets a little bit confusing. Um, or you can reach me uh, by phone, which is 250-327-4779. That's wonderful. And I'm going to, we are going to repeat it again during the program. In your experience, what have been the most difficult patients to deal with? Can we go down that road for a second? Because, you know, everybody's got their stuff, but is there, 
you know, what, what have you found to be the most challenging people to work with? Definitely. Um, all my clients are great. <laughs> of course um, they are. That's of course right. they yeah. are. There's no question about that. Of course. <laughs> I would say, I would say kind of, there's two kind of sides of that again, right. I work with pediatrics. Um, so something that I didn't consider when I got into that line of work was parents. Um, and so you're working with the kids, of course, but the parents are just as much as included. And so there is some stickier, as I like to say it, stickier parents um, that demand a little bit more of you and want a little extra things and um, which I'm okay with doing, but you have to set your healthy boundaries, of course. Yeah. Um, and then I would say in terms of, you know, ICBC or orthopedic clients, um, I would say the more difficult ones are just the individuals that constantly come saying, you know, I'm in pain, I have, you know, X, Y, and Z, but then they never do their program. Yeah. Um, or they never really kind of help themselves. And so I can only do so much for you. And at some point you have to kind of take initiative as well. Um, some clients are very honest saying, Hey, I'm never going to do an at-home program. Let's see you two or three times a week. And that just be it. Um, which is totally fair. Um, where others are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Um, and then you talk to them. Next they week don't. Like, yeah. Yeah. They don't. And the weeks so. go by so fast, the days, the hours, like everything this in this day and age, I cannot believe, and this is going to date this program a little bit, but as, it, as such, we're, we're filming in spring We're we're talking in spring. Um, it's so much nicer outside so you can sort of it's easier to make commitments when you know it's going to be lovely out but on those winter days when it's cold and it's dark and it's rainy and yes we live in a rainforest and yes we can expect it but you know doing a hike when you know outside in the cold wet isn't always fun right it's harder to get people how do you feel about uh, painkillers and medications as a support mechanism for Ken? Or do you feel that that most of the the uh, problems with our body can be dealt with with the proper support from exercise, stretching, that kind of thing? What are your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I would say as as my regulatory body, I never give advice on medications. Of course, I have my own personal opinion, um, and I would say they have they have a purpose. Um, and the unfortunate part is I'm not in a person's body, right? So if they're experiencing just constant chronic pain, I don't know that. And I don't know their pain threshold. So what gets them kind of through the day, they have to be the, their decider in that. Um, but again, they do have a, they do have a purpose. Um, I'm always a little leery because they're kind of give you kind of like a false superhuman power, right? Like if we have a shoulder injury and I'm pumping Tylenol, um, I don't know my limitations very much. And so if you come to me under kind of the, the Tylenol when it's still working really well and we go through a whole exercise routine and then you go home and then you're super sore, right? Because we didn't fully listen to our body. So yeah. I always advise them, um, clients to, or I'm sorry, I don't advise them, but I prefer them not to take anything before my sessions. And then if they have to, that's up to them, just so we know our own limitations. Um, they have a point. I, I never use them, but I'm also young and I don't have a lot of other commitments. So I feel like it's unfair to go off that, but I, I just like to know what my body is actually feeling day to day as opposed yeah, to. I, I think that you make a really good point, Krista. I think, especially when it comes to, and again, you know, I'm not a doctor, you're not a doctor, right? We have, uh, yeah, this is merely an opinion. And, and so we, certainly we encourage you to go see your medical professionals. That's, you know, they're the ones that know better. Um, but I like what you're saying about understanding what our own body threshold is. If we've masked it in some way, we can't really see um, either this, the improvement or the depth of the pain, right? Um, I, I know for myself in this last while, uh, you know, I've, I've found that medications simply don't work. There comes to a point when medications just don't work and you need to have another way for your body to understand really what's happening to it and find a way to, to work your way through it because our bodies are quite magical, aren't they? Right. They, so they can heal so well, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, they definitely can. Yeah. And that's yeah. the thing too, like the, the medications again, like probably have a place, especially at the beginning to alleviate some pain and discomfort, but over time too. And, and with that, obviously exercise and active rehab take a little while, right? So hopefully yes. as medication decrease, you know, the improvement from active rehab in, increases as well, right? So then um, you're, you're better off in a few months and you're taking less medication and you're doing more active rehab. Yeah. 
It's about managing expectations, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. How, how do you advise people to manage their expectations when they are coming to you in the early days, right? Is there, is there something that we can help people understand about those, those early, early days of rehabilitation? Yeah, I would say a lot of people get set on a timeline, right? We want to know, hey, am I going to be better in two months? Am I going to be better in three months? You know, if I do this twice a week, am I going to, you know, and I don't have the answer to that. Um, like I already had kind of mentioned, it, it depends on a lot of factors. And so, um, again, that expectation of if I commit for a few few months, is it going to be better? And, um, you know, kind of just saying, hey, we're kind of open-minded here. We're, we're working together and we're figuring out, but it's kind of a journey we're on together. Um, I don't know the exact timeline and things like that. Yeah. It, and journeys do take a while. And sometimes you run into obstacles, right? That's the problem, right? With the business of living is, you know, three steps forward, sometimes two steps back, but always keep pushing forward because when you do, great results will come. What do you love about the work that you do? Um, I would say there's, there's, there's many things. Uh, the first thing is just working with many different people, right? I see, um, you know, five, six, seven people a day right now. And, and it's, and it's exciting. Sometimes that's the best, but the worst part, <laughs> but, um, you know, just having conversations, um, you know, once you're, you know, establish a relationship, you have a good conversation, you get to know people a little bit better. That's always exciting. I get to know about their lives and, and things like that. Um, I would say I love, I love actor rehab. I love correcting, you know, postural difficulties or movement imbalances or dysfunction, um, anything like that. I love figuring out how I can help people so that they're more pain free or, or less pain, or they're in less pain essentially. Yeah. Um, I love that as well. I would say with my kids, um, working with kids is so great. They kind of take you into a new environment, right? I often think that adults, their, main, their minds are racing, right? We have so many things on the go and with kids, it's just simple. We have this activity we're doing together. And so um, but working with kids has been awesome, a great balance for what I'm doing right now as well. Yeah, it, it's nice to have all ages in the mix. You know, I'm, do you find that children are easier to deal with than older people? Or do you think they're both different, but the same in, in different ways? Yeah, I would say kind of different, but the same in certain ways. Uh, kids are, you know, you need to bring the energy, right? And so if I'm having, you know, a day that I'm a little bit off getting kind of psyched up to yeah. come work with the kids is something you have to work on, um, yeah. as well as, you know, you have behavioral difficulties too, right? So sometimes you're trying to be in line with how the parents would parent as well, because they're not my kids, right? right. Um, but at the same time, kids are very, I don't know, vibrant and honest and, and they tell you how it is, right? Where with adults, you know, we're a little bit more in line with being mischievous and um, <laughs> don't do our exercise programs and things like that, where, you know, you have that expectations of an adult but with a kid, you don't really have those expectations, right? So yeah, it's true. The children are, they have almost no filter. That's right. They have no filter. Yeah. I had a kid, a uh, kiddo once tell me that uh, they preferred me wearing a mask. <laughs> So I was like, okay. Oh, <laughs> it's not adorable. Yeah. Especially now for kids to say that, that they prefer the mask. How do you find working with uh, the mask just as a, as a general you know, perspective? How do you find when you're trying to uh, work with an individual, it, do you find the mask to be an impediment or is it just really quite easy for you? Uh, I would say with, you know, the adult or orthopedic population, definitely, definitely is fine. Um, yeah. You know, although you're there to build a relationship, you're not there to fully connect. Um, yeah. So you can still lead them through exercise and different things. I would say the mask has hid some facial expressions that I sometimes try and read into. So, you know, if a client is um, you know, in pain, you can usually tell by the face if they're yeah. in pain, uh, where the mask might hide that a little bit. So I have to pay, um, kind of better attention to that with kids. It's definitely more difficult because you're trying to really connect with kids and you have to be very, um, expressive and exuberant and things like that. And so it's been hard to connect with new kids, um, that don't know me without a mask. So often if we're outside and it's a safe way, I'll, I'll take quite a few steps back and say, this is what my expression would look like. And then they would <laughs> put it back up, sanitize, just because you want that connection, right? And they, I want them to know that I'm just joking or I'm having fun with them or something yeah, like that. Yeah, completely understand what you're saying there. It, yeah. it is, it's, you know, the facial cues are so important for really 
establishing that connection. It's more than just the eyes, although the eyes are very helpful. You know, God gave us this face that we could do so much with, right? And so it's really important that we have the, the benefit of being able to share uh, to share our facial cues with people for how we feel. Um, we're just about finished the program. We've got a few more minutes left. And, and you know, obviously, because we do, I've got some more questions. But this is another good time for you to shout out your information. So how do people reach you again, Krista? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you can reach me by email or phone. Email uh, would be Krista at wildwoodhealth.com. So K-R-I-S-T-A at wildwoodhealth.com, uh, wild with an E. Um, or my phone number, which is 250-327-4779. So in the process of doing this work, um, may I invite you to share with us some of your real challenges in doing, in building the business and getting, you know, the word out and doing what it is that you, like, what kind of challenges have you experienced that might be helpful to someone who's seeking uh, services from you or, or just overall um, looking at business in this time of COVID? Definitely. Um, I would say the first thing that pops to mind is just um, being patient. You know, we, my personality or anyone who probably is starting their own business is probably a little bit more A type when it comes to those sorts of things. And so you have timelines and deadlines and you want to get this done and that done. And, and so I would say last September, I really had to take a step back and understand that, um, you know, things will happen kind of when they happen. That doesn't mean I'm not working hard and going after what I want, but it also means that, you know, we're in a pandemic and there's lots of things going on. So just to be patient and understand that. Um, that would probably be the biggest thing. And I notice it right now, um, two of my friends and I are also starting a soccer camp and we really wanted to do the soccer camp last year and it just didn't work out. And so, um, you know, we're starting it back up this year, but again, to just be patient and understand that it might not even run because we don't know what's going to happen in a few weeks. Right. So, um, just be patient and understanding it and trust yourself and trust the process. Um, you know, like people said, the journey is kind of the fun part as cliche as that sounds like kind of enjoy the, the little steps and the little things that you got to figure out. Um, don't just focus on that one end result. Yeah. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I, I, I think it's very important for people not to focus on the end result, but to sort of be present in every step of the way. Um, in your, in getting your degree and putting everything together, um, did you, you know, what would you say to a fresh S student who's looking at taking, uh, you know, this kind of a path, uh, for their future? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say like, yeah, just have an idea of where you want to go. Um, I would also say that you're kind of coming into it at a really good time. Kinesiology is starting to expand. So even six, seven years ago, when I first went into it, it was really unknown or even less known, right? Um, where now a lot of communities or clinics have kinesiologists, um, you can get experience. And again, that's part of the advocation that I want to do is that people often view kin as a stepping stone. So you get your kin degree and you go into PT, you get your kin degree, you go into chiropractor where kin can actually be a profession in itself and um, a career. And so that's again, coming back to the advocation piece that your four-year degree can be something that um, gives you the career that you're looking for as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I hear what you're saying about those new things. You know, I remember a time when chiropractic was very new. It wasn't really new. It was ancient, but it was new in community. And and same with physiotherapy for a while, you know, it was like I people were unsure about it. They didn't know whether it would be a benefit or not. And I think that it's important that people recognize is that this, you know, this body that we have requires more than a one-stop shop. Sometimes we need to have uh, a few different modalities to get repair. And especially as we get older, right? What would you recommend to a young person uh, on how to care for their body so that when they get to be in the third stage of life, they have some, a, a different experience than they might've thought of uh, had they not paid attention? Definitely. Um, it's kind of all the thing, those things we learn, but we, some people just don't take them into practice, right? It's, it's keeping active. It's, you know, eating balanced. Um, I find my generation is really obsessed with something called macro counting and different things like that, which mm. I, I'm not a fan of eat balanced, right? Um, you know, have chips during the week. Don't just limit it to weekends and things like that. Again, just completely balanced. 
um, get enough sleep, right? Get your seven, eight hours, especially when you can. It's so funny. My family, uh, my two siblings have had young kids, right? So they always say, get the sleep now. So again, <laughs> get the sleep now, right? I don't have to. You know. um, but yeah, just all those things that we've learned that, you know, sometimes we, we stray away from a little bit, but again, just sleep, you know, nutrition, um, exercise, physical activity, um, just again, keep them all balanced and you're way better off for sure. Yeah, no doubt. I, I know for myself, I can remember that I remember the food pyramid. I talked about it on the show before, which I think is quite antiquated, to be honest with you. I think we need a new food pyramid, but it was it was really and has always been about balance. But balance, the definition of balance for people is different depending on the person. So what is balance to you may be very different to a balance to somebody else. But I think what you're saying is, is that, you know, those simple rudiments of, you know, eight hours of sleep or as much sleep as you can get, you know, a good diet, um, you know, just overall health is a, is a combination of things. Is that what I hear from you? That's right. That's right. And I, and I believe at least that people generally know, you know, fast food every day is not a great choice and things like that. And of course, you know, you're speaking to, it can get quite deep, you know, socioeconomic status and things like that. And what people are able to afford, you know, vegetables aren't the cheapest option anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, right. Um, like you said, balance is a little bit different for each person, but I always try to kind of, yeah, just the 80, 20 rule, right. For nutrition, right. You're eating 80% healthy, 20% fast food or whatever kind of fills your shoes, um, exercise, trying to get 150 minutes a week, right. That's the Canadian general guideline. Um, that can be, you know, walking, biking, running, or, um, and then it wants two to three strength trainings a week too. Again, that can be just loading a wheelbarrow up and taking it to the backyard to do some landscaping, yeah. right? It doesn't have yeah. to be complicated. Um, things just to stress our body. So we're, you know, strengthening bones and building muscles and keeping active. Sorry, and, and you, I thought I heard you say 150 minutes a week. Is that correct? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's the general guideline that um, I, I'm pretty sure it's Canada gives out is um, kind of moderate activity of 150 minutes a week. So, I mean, if you break it down, you're doing, you know, 30 minutes Monday to Friday, right? So that's really um, not that hard to do, is it? No, I, I don't think so, especially with what um, nicer weather out, right? Just get out for a little walk after dinner or something like that. And yeah. Well, especially if you have a pet, if you have dogs or, you know, something that can be walked, it's, I think the science has shown that actually, if you have a dog, you are that much more likely to be a bit healthier because you are taking the dog out for that mandatory, you know, 150 minutes at least uh, yeah. per month. I, or I like to think so. I mean, yeah. <laughs> my Jack Russell's, I have two, as our listeners well know, because they've heard her, them both barking often in the program. Uh, been lucky today, actually, they're sleeping quite nicely. So I can't, I can't complain in the moment. Um, but they do, they keep people active for sure. How do you feel about, um, there, there are uh, so many stories now about water, right? And I know that this is, you know, maybe it's part of kin, maybe it's not. Um, but some people drink way too much water and they feel unwell and then others don't drink anywhere near enough. Doctors say eight glasses a day. You know, when you're working with people, what do you recommend for those kinds of things? Definitely. Um, I always go, might be personal, but I always go off urine color. So each body is different. Yeah. Um, you know, my body size, it depends on muscle. It depends on weight. It depends on so many factors in terms of what your ideal hydration is. So you want your urine to be almost clear, um, essentially. And that lets you know, you're hydrated enough. Um, if you haven't been drinking much water, um, do it very slowly over, you know, a few weeks because you're just going to be peeing tons and that's not always enjoyable either. So, you know, no. do it slowly. If you only have, yeah, four cups a day, try and have five and then try and have six or something like that. Um, but water is very important. I would say, yeah, you want it to be kind of a faint yellow or kind of a clear and that lets you know you're hydrated. You know, that's a really good point for people. I don't think that many people remember that that's a urine issue. So having, you know, very clear urine, you're quite right. It, it means that the bladder is working properly. There's things going through. 
again, we're not doctors, but you know, the idea of making sure that you've got hydration is very much to do with urine and skin as well, your elasticity in your skin and, you know, and, and exercise certainly helps with all of those things, your sweat and all of that stuff helps to give you that moisture that as older people, you know, we start to lose, we lose our muscle, con our muscle mass, we lose different things. Can you help our audience understand some of those things briefly? I recognize that this is kind of a loaded question, but you know, how can we really look after the the muscles in a way that is um that makes sense for everybody something something that is easy for everybody to do yeah oh for sure um you know i'm a big uh fan of just bands so you know a lot of people you can buy bands kind of anywhere you have those like bara bands they're called you know you can get them at costco you can get them at london drugs you can get them kind of anywhere superstore things like that and there's tons of activities you can do with bands um there's cool little gadgets you just put in your doorway, your little door jam, and then locks it in. So you can pull them and stretch them and move them. And just even that bit of resistance um, allows you to keep up some strength. Um, then you can just in increase the band um, strength, right, too. So there's different colors for different intensities. So, you know, you can move up to different strengths and again, do other exercises. That's all inside that can be in your own home. That's safe. You know, you can tie it to chair. You can do leg exercises. Um, bands maybe cost five, 10 bucks, right? So cheap. And still keeping up strength and stuff. Um, that would probably be. Oh my God, you could take them everywhere. Take them everywhere. You can take them to the hotel if you really want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anywhere. Um, and that's something that I would say that um, you can do that still maintains and it's not unsafe. Um, you know, when I have worked with seniors, it's worrying about their safety too. I don't want to give any exercises that I'm worried they might fall or put themselves in a dangerous position. So with bands, you know, you can do band work seated. So if I'm worried that they might fall, I can do arm exercises attached to a door jam in a seated position for them as well yeah that's huge i mean i remember i don't know do you know who jack Lane is uh i think you mentioned him is it him yeah it's a him yeah it's a him. i think you mentioned this last time i was on the show yeah. <laughs> i think I, i'll just i always remember jack Lane, and he was and for our older listeners they will know who jack Lane is but jack Lane used to take you know jugs right you know milk jugs or well in the day it was milk bottles right but he used to also take like cans of you know tomato cans and things like that and use those as weights people get hung up on having to have all this really expensive equipment and like you said just having some simple exercise bands is you know one really easy and affordable way to get some strength back into the body right? And we, because we do, we lose strength. I mean, I, what I could do when I was 20 and what I can do while I'm, you know, much older, <laughs> very different. It's just right. very different. Well, and that's the thing, going back to the Fitbits too, people are, you know, I have to have this good watch that tracks all these steps so I can get fit. And, it, and it's not true, right? You just, you kind of just need something, you need some physical activity and, and you need to be active, right? Yeah, totally. Is there anybody in the field, anybody professionally or on television or in sports that you admire specifically uh, for the way that they take care of themselves? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I have an old soccer coach. She was, um, Andrea Neal, she's a super awesome soccer player, played Canadian soccer. Um, she was actually my idol when I was younger, which is the craziest part because then I got to be coached by her. And I told her that I had this picture oh. with her forever ago. So, um, but she took care of herself. Like, you know, salads were, um, you know, spinach and mixed green with a little bit of olive oil and, you know, lemon and things like that, where I'm a little bit, I won't say a foodie, but I like my food and I also like my junk food. And so, um, but she was, I think she was 43. She had a kid, um, super safe birth, things like that, which most people I don't think could do. So no, she was fit too. She would come into the gym sometimes just to, um, you know, see what we were doing and she'd join in and she could do most of what we could, we were doing in our, you know, prime years. Right. And no, she took care of herself and I'm sure she still is today. I'm sure she is as well. But people don't usually stop taking care of themselves unless there's a health issue. And at that, it's just a matter of time to bring it back again. And, you know, people go through seasons and, you know, sometimes life isn't always easy for sure. All right. I know earlier I said we were getting ready to close out the program, but this time we really are getting ready to close out the program. So two things are going to happen. Number one, if you have just tuned in, thanks for tuning in today. We're so glad that you did. You are listening to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FM. Our guest has been Krista Whitaker from Wildwood Health. She's a kinesiologist. I hope I got it right. 
I love trying new words. But of course, everybody knows who listens to my program. I scrub people's names. And this is kind of like a name. So <laughs> even though I didn't, I didn't mess up Krista Whitaker's name, I may have messed up what she does. However, you can find out more about it by simply taking down this information. Krista, how do people reach you? Yep, you can reach me by phone, 250-327-4779, uh, or by email, which is Krista at wildwoodhealth.com. Uh, Krista is K-R-I-S-T-A, and wild has an E at the end. Fantastic. All right, this is the part of the show where we get to find out your wisdom, my darling. So if there was something that you could say to our community, to uh, the people that are watching our program uh, on YouTube and worldwide, what would you like to share as a teaching uh, takeaway moment, a teaching moment? You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I know, but it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, you know, the two things came to mind. The first was, you know, if we were kind of giving wisdom with the business plan, it would just to kind of be patient and understand. And, um, you know, I would say something that I'm really trying to work on. So maybe I'll give that a little bit of wisdom is um, having self-compassion. So I'm super tough on myself and, um, you know, now through a pandemic and then starting my own thing, um, you know, trying to still stay connected and stay compassionate with myself and, and give myself what I would give somebody else. Um, and so, yeah, be kind, be self-compassionate, all that good stuff. Great answer. I have to say compassion and empathy, we easily give it away, but truly we have to keep a little bit for ourselves, for sure. Krista Whitaker, thank you so much for being a guest on the program today. I'm so glad that you joined us. Thanks, Kathy. I had lots of fun. Good. I'm glad you did. Hey, you guys, that's it for another episode of Act 3 on CHOY 101.7 FM. I have great news for you. Great, wonderful news. I know you've been waiting darn near a year for this news. I've been talking about it for what seems to be forever. However, Act 3 is now on Shaw Spotlight. Tune in every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 o'clock in the morning on, on uh, Shaw uh, and at 11 o'clock at night. And it is also airing iVancouver Island wide. So check your local listings. Act 3 has arrived on Shaw Television. So thank you so much for tuning into that and for always joining us every Monday on Act 3. Thanks again and have an amazing day. Bye for now.